Welcome to the 120th TMIT National Research Testbed webinar. It's just such a thrill to now have done 10 years or have, uh, after today, having, we will be, uh, complete our 120th webinar, 10 years, it's our 10 year anniversary. Uh, I am uh, Charles Denham, I'm going to be the moderator today and am very pleased to have such a great group. Uh, housekeeping details at first, let's make sure that uh, you have your speaker volume on the max, that you have the WebEx, volume on the max uh, and your computer volume on the max to make sure that you have good audio. And if you don't, uh, you can then, and I'm on, for those of you that are looking at the slide, slide four, you can uh, go to uh, the um, icon for participants and click on request the phone icon and then we'll give you a call in number. For those of you that uh, do not have slides yet, uh, go, uh, go to www.safetyleaders.org. Uh, in the upper right hand corner of the landing page, you'll see upcoming events. If you click on that, it will take you to today's webinar so you can download the slides. For those that are watching this on demand uh, in future, uh, we uh, will let you know that we'll continue to add assets to that page and you can watch the video uh, of the uh, webinar uh, today with the slides and be able to download the slides. When you go to the landing page, you'll see John Nance's uh, photograph there and the, uh, uh, the date and uh, additional resources will be posted uh, on this web page for you. On uh, slide seven uh, are our social media accounts and we're gonna make a commitment in 2019 to be more active there to send linkages to you of key assets and patient safety. We are on slide eight now. Our purpose is we'll measure our success by how we protect and enrich the lives of families, patients, and caregivers. And today we are emphasizing not only the patients but the caregivers on a number of the initiatives of the last 10 years and then as we go forward, some of the impact areas that we'll focus on. Our mission is to accelerate performance solutions that save lives, save money, and create value in the communities we serve. And uh, our disclosure statement uh, is on slide nine, but none of the speakers uh, or reactors have anything to disclose. No product, service, or technology will be uh, addressed, uh, and no, pharma no funding directly, indirectly, uh, in any way has come from uh, the healthcare industry. Uh, we have a number of speakers and reactors. Many are, on, uh, rec are recorded because of the time uh, that we have, and a number are on with us today. We have John Nance, uh, the best-selling author, patient safety champion, and one of our great uh, great global leaders in patient safety. Uh, Dr. Greg Boats will comment. We do have uh, Chief uh, Bill Adcox, really kind of the father of threat safety science and a uh, real champion for, for safety in organizations and organizational health safety. Jennifer Dingman, uh, one of our fabulous uh, patient advocates uh, who we'll, we'll come to first. And then we have, uh, we'll acknowledge Becky Martins, who couldn't make it today. Arlene Salamandro is with us live and the former president of the American Nursing Association, one of our patient advocates, Mary Foley, has a recorded message. Dan Ford, thank you so much, Dan, for being with us today. And Heather Foster, one of the winners of the Pete Conrad Global Patient Safety Award, will speak uh, with us. Also have some recordings from a former CMS leader, uh, Tom Valak from CMS, Roger Resar, one of our fabulous his historical champions of patient safety, uh, Ginny McBride, who is uh, an organ procurement uh, organization CEO who co-wrote with me the Safe Practice for Organ Donorship, Frank Federico, one of the great leaders of IHI representing them, will address uh, towards the end of the, the webinar today our focus uh, on the Healthcare Innocence Project and some collaboration with Heather Foster, John Nance, and others, Jean Huddleston from the Mayo Clinic, and we'll also be addressing uh, the opioid crisis and drug diversion both with Dr. McDowell and Kim New. We're kind of setting the stage for this next year. And finally, Nancy Conrad, the founder of the Conrad uh, uh, Movement, the Conrad Foundation, and uh, a real mover and shaker in patient safety, who for founded the Pete Conrad Global Patient Safety Award, and Steve Swenson, uh, formerly with the uh, Mayo Clinic, uh, who is uh, is one of our global leaders now in burnout and the impact on patient safety. Uh, Jenny Dingman uh, will open us. We always want to have the voice of, pa of patients, and Jenny has just been a fabulous. Uh, 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 terrific force uh, 
uh, in patient safety in the advocacy area, along with Dan Ford and the other group. Uh, she is uh, uh, the founder of uh, Pulse the Colorado Division, but actually the co-founder of it globally, and uh, we are so blessed to have Jenny, a published author in patient safety, a contributor to the National Quality Forum Safe Practices, and also a real champion of our TMIT National Research Testbed work. Uh, Jen Jennifer, would you please open us? Thank you so much, Dr. Denham. First and foremost, I want to congratulate you and safety leaders for these great webinars. Uh, this is the 100th, it's just, it's like the, a big episode in what we're doing and I'm just so excited and happy to be here today and I want to welcome everyone who's here, especially our speakers and panelists. This is going to be such a great webinar. Again, thank you everyone who's listening live and those who are going to be listening later on demand, thank you for your dedication to patient safety and making patients safer all over the world. Thank you so much, and I'll hand it back over to you, Dr. Denna. Thank you, Jenny, and we'll be coming back to you shortly. So generally we cover what's in the news and, the national, and our survey from the last month. Uh, today I'll just address some of the YouTube videos that we've done to capture what's in the news and the latest area, uh, areas of work since we have a lot of speakers. And uh, the goal of today's webinar is really to give you a sampler of some great topics for which we have prior webinars and in 2019 to set the stage for some areas that we really know that are critical. Uh, these five videos are now on YouTube. You can use these links and copy the links into your browser. Uh, one is on the opioid overdose crisis and this really not only addresses the crisis but specifically the care of the caregiver and the first responders that can be exposed to fentanyl and carfentanil. Sudden car car cardiac arrest, we address the latest data at how critical it is to get to patients within three minutes. And we address in that video uh, the example work of uh, O'Hare uh, Airport where they put AEDs, automatic external defibrillators, within a minute and a half walking distance uh, and, and have over a 70% save rate by bystanders, not by formally trained employees of O'Hare Airport, but these are just bystanders that are saving other fellow travelers' lives. And to have an over 70% survival rate when nationally we're at about 10.8% just shows the proximity of having such uh, supplies. Active shooter events in healthcare is the third one, and we summarize the article in the New England Journal of Medicine and how important it is to really modify your approach in a healthcare institution. Highly recommend the article, and we address the article in the video. And then the MedTAC uh, uh, Lifeguard Surf Program and the MedTAC Bystander Care Training Program, which we'll cover a little bit later. Doc, uh, Dr. Greg Boats uh, is one of our co-leaders and champions of it, along with uh, Chief uh, Bill Adcox, who will be speaking later. And this is the pre-hospital care environment and what to do in the first 10 minutes before first responders arrive. So um, I will cover a lot of what, what's been in the news so that we can really get to our speakers quickly, but we do want to review the review reviews of the work of the last webinar. Uh, we had a terrific presentation by, by Kathleen Bartholomew, uh, uh, John, uh, John Nance's partner, wife, and uh, co-author, and she addressed dauntless leaders in nursing. Uh, she did a terrific job uh, on this topic, and a lot of times when we cover leadership topics, because our audience are so clinically focused, we we drop down in our net promoter score uh, because some people just feel like we really want a lot of tangible, tactical, clinical uh, meat. Uh, and we were constantly surprised by you as an audience that want more leadership uh, and like the leadership uh, areas. In fact, uh, the net promoter score and the question was, I'm, I'm interested in more opportunities for nurses and patient safety. You, you all gave, 69% of you gave it a 10, 19% a 9. Uh, the net promoter score is off the charts there, so you've got 97% uh, you know, of you agree. I can tell you we're going to bring Kathleen back. We're going to address more of what nurses can do, not a retread of what we've already done, but actually focus on the, on these areas. We ask you to put in the free text entry uh, section what you'd like to have covered. We're listening. We're going to include all of the areas that are pardon, pardon me, listed on slide 18. I won't read them for you. We ask the question, do you want a webinar on patient safety and emergency care, uh, department care? And this includes pre-hospital 
through the emergency department and the transition back, especially through discharge precautions. And we see 56% of you gave it a 10, 17% a 9. Some folks didn't, were not that interested in it, but we've got uh, scores like this. We're definitely coming back to you with emergency medicine uh, topics. On slide 20, I won't read them to you. We'll cover all the areas that you addressed. And later when we do our survey at the end of this webinar, we'd like you to put, we've asked the question again about emergency care. We'd like to have you address those. So now to introduce our speakers and move quickly to those uh, that are on the line and those we've recorded, uh, as you probably know, in June of uh, 2018, uh, Modern Healthcare and other media press uh, picked up on the AHRQ report of the impact of the hospital-acquired conditions. Many of us call them the hacks. Uh, and between 2014 and 2016, uh, it appears that they saved $2.9 billion uh, and prevented uh, about 8,000 uh, deaths. Uh, and this is an incredible, uh, this is an incredible impact that we're, uh, that we're seeing. So uh, uh, these are the hacks uh, there on slide 22. Uh, this is an incredible impact. Just between 2014 and 2016, there are estimates between, between the 2016 and 2019 of even greater numbers, and we don't want to exaggerate, but these areas of adverse drug events, Encati, Clebsi, Clostridium difficile, falls, obstetrical adverse events, pressure ulcers, surgical site infections, VAP, uh, PEs, uh, um, incredible, uh, incredible results because incentives were tied to them. Uh, so a brief story. Tom Valak is a, both an MD and a JD. He is, was formerly a senior advisor and medical officer for CMS. He advised uh, HHS regarding Medicare payment, quality of care, and value-based purchasing. Uh, Tom Valak, uh, uh, almost 10 years ago, uh, took me aside after he left CMS. He had joined NQF, and we were at an NQF meeting, and I remember the day, uh, and I, he and I chatted this week uh, about this. He took me aside. He said, I have a secret to tell you. I said, what? And he said, I, I, I can't be quoted now, but maybe someday in the future that the grassroots approach that you at TMIT did with your patient advocates of, of creating a letter writing campaign and writing your arguments regarding the support of the hacks actually pushed them across the goal line and they wouldn't have happened without the grassroots effort that you launched. I said, you got to be kidding. And he said, no, uh, CMS counted every one of the letters. And, and what we had done on a Saturday morning team of the folks I'm going to introduce here in a moment, um, we decided that I would write an argument for each one of the hacks. Now, this was easy for me to do because I wrote uh, the majority of the NQF safe practices narrative and the problem statements and the impact of the best practices for the National Quality Forum safe practices. So I had all the data, had all of the evidence, had all of the references and could write a bibliography for each one. So I wrote individual arguments for each one. We made them as a separate page, and then we had the team I'm about ready to introduce at, on our Saturday morning group get out to friends, family, other doctors, uh, other nurses, other uh, caregivers, folks from nursing homes, cousins, aunts, uncles, everybody that we knew, and said, please write a letter and attach any one of these are these arguments to what you personally believe are important, so it's not looking like a form letter. And then we all had a hard time uploading them to the CMS website. So we, we took one of our employees and had her act as a help desk. Vivian Lauderdale acted as a helper and a help desk to upload the letters. Well, it turned out that every letter ended up on a grid and letters from the American Hospital Association and the AMA were one letter, and yet we had I don't know what the number was, but an enormous number of individual letters written by individuals, both caregivers and the public, that argued for the hacks. And so this week, Tom said, yes, I, I can go on the record to tell you that, yes, that actually happened and that you guys, the impact that that you had helped us get them across the goal line. So his quote was, and I couldn't record him because he was really busy this week and, and moving around, the success of the, eight, the hack incentives and their impact on saving lives and money is a testimony to the fact that consumers have a say in healthcare and patient safety. I asked him about the future. So what should we focus on in the future? He said there is much to be done in value-based care or performance improvement, measures, other data, incentives, and coordination definitely can drive change. 
So we're so grateful that Tom would go on the record and 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 uh, congratulate these wonderful people that you see now on uh, the next slide. Becky Martins, who was going to be on today and had an emergency, last minute emergency, who you all are well here frequently, and Kyle, what I'd like to do is insert uh, a recording of her um, affirmation. She, she regularly will come on and give us the affirmation that to focus on the people and families and say, listen, were it not for your work, there would not be birthdays and graduations and new births and celebrations and wonderful things in families, and she does it far better than I can, so I won't t steal her thunder. But I'd like to now talk to each one of uh, the folks here, and I'm going to I have a recording from Mary Foley as well. But, Dan, I'd like to have you tell us what you think we should celebrate, and I know you're a real champion of what you think we should do in the future in reference to root cause analysis. Dan. Dan, are you on mute? Yeah, thank you. I, sh I, I you know, what we should celebrate, I think, at the top of the list um, is, is patient engagement. Um, you, you have exemplified that, Chuck, by your involvement of those of us on the phone call, plus others you've mentioned, plus others uh, over the years. And you have exemplified the fact that we are a member of the team, uh, that our voice does need to be heard. Um, I think that um, it's through this, and there are a couple of key words that I just wrote down this morning I was thinking about. Um, uh, the, 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 some key words are empathy, respect, and mindfulness that I think the patients that are involved in their own care and become advocates for others uh, really, really need. D do you want me to hit the RCAs now, Chuck, too? Yeah, and, and I think just give us a, a, a short f focus on what you think we should focus on in the future and the example is engaging I, patients and families in root cause analysis. I think you're our global champion of that. Well, I, I, a few other words too that, that we really need to focus, to continue to focus on is transparency, cost management, uh, population health, uh, uh, everybody as disruptors for patient safety, for the prevention of medical errors. I uh, mentioned patient family engagement, IT and security, which is gonna be talked about uh, and then the whole opioid crisis, um, and I will, and then, uh, and then true north. Everybody needs to live their true north in every decision that they make. Um, there are various reasons for the heart of that. In my own case, it's my faith, and other other people, it's other reasons. But don't let anybody ever, ever dissuade you from doing what is right. Uh, the opioid thing will, will lead me into why I'm such a big advocate for inviting, keyword, inviting the patient family to participate in their own root cause analysis. Um, <clears throat> came out of uh, the medical errors that my first wife experienced and very quick, very quick profile. She went in for a hysterectomy and um, she ended up with what should have been one surgery, one hospitalization. She ended up with four surgeries or hospitalizations over seven months. Um, she um, has had at least seven medical errors, including the overdose on morphine, the opioid. Uh, she has permanent brain damage, permanent short-term memory loss. Uh, we had a nine-year medical malpractice lawsuit. Um, and uh, all of this, I, I was a, a nationally known healthcare executive search consultant. Um, Ashram, the, the risk manager organization affiliated with H A A H A, tapped me on the shoulder and said, "This is 2002 and three. Would, would you participate in a task force on patient safety? We're just launching. It will it will last for 10 months, a year, or something like that. I forget what it was. And I was I was the one person uh, representing the voice of the patient." And one of the things that I had started to think about, I was so offended by the way I was treated when I started asking questions was, why not right away sit down and tell the patient and family member what happened? I don't know that that hospital in Chicago suburbs had RCA process at the time. I heard about it later on, but if they did or if they didn't, the principle still applies that the patient and family members should be invited to participate in their own uh, uh, 
root cause analysis and I've just got a, just a few benefits listed here. Um, and that includes, first of all, it's the right thing to do. Uh, it'll break down barriers, prevent barriers from building following sentinel events. It will be a continuation of the partnering started in the physician office as well as the hospitalization. I think it's good business. Um, if it, it may, lead, may or may not lead to a lawsuit, but either way, the odds are very strong that any settlement that can or should come out of this is going to be a lot less than if it goes through a trial. Um, and again, it, it may prevent the lawsuit, but it may not. Um, it will continue to contribute to learning. The patient sometimes, or fa and sometimes the family member, is the common thread. It's the only common thread. The person's the only common thread throughout the entire patient experience. Uh, well, Dan, again, Dan, Dan, we'll have, uh, uh, when, we, uh, when John finishes about accountability, I think you really hit the theme, you know, of accountability there, which, which is key. So some of the other attributes, if you want to save those for the reaction period so we can go to Arlene, let's do that. But I want to come back to it, and Dan, we're going to have you speak on this topic uh, in 2019. It's a, it's a key yeah, issue, and I think I John will be, be addressing accountability. Uh, Ar Ar Arlene, Arlene uh, uh, what do you think we should celebrate and focus on in the future? And you've been such a champion on, the, on of this issue of bullying and the abuse of power in organizations, and I think uh, uh, you've helped us really keep focus there. Uh, thank you, Chuck. Um well, first of all, I'm a patient uh, who also experienced a medical error. So I understand the impact it has on the family, and it's a lasting impact. <clears throat> I became a long-term uh, caregiver in a facility in a non-clinical position. And uh, because of my experience, I really uh, saw patient safety as my priority. And leaders in, a, in an organization, they set the culture of their facility and how they deal with patient safety concerns. So as an employee, a frontline worker who uh, did come forward and report a patient safety concern, uh, the leadership in my organization um, did not take it the way I thought it they would. And I was personally bullied. Uh, I was retaliated against and eventually I was fired. Uh, because I spoke up, and I don't regret that I did speak up. I would do it again. So I think um, the facilities, the leadership really sets their culture, and it's so important. If you want good frontline workers, uh, loyal, caring, giving, um, you have to set the culture where, where they would be protected by HR, too. So I hope Great. in the future that we can look more into that. So again, after John covers accountability, we'll have you and Dan both react to uh, what John addresses. So we could really talk about some of these specific things like creating the, the Healthcare Innocence Project and getting families and, uh, involved in root cause analysis. And I think just seeing your faces on this slide and seeing the impact that you guys had by leading grassroots support for these things, I think the persistence has really paid off. And uh, so, Jenny, persistence, you've been a persistent patient advocate. Uh, any advice to us? And again, thank you, Jenny, for your steadfast support of helping so many people who individually have patient, uh, patient errors. And again, thank all of you on the screen. We'll go to Mary in just a minute with her recording. But uh, uh, Jennifer, we uh, thank you and want you to comment as well. And then we'll move to, to Mary. Thank you, Dr. Denham, um, and everyone. Uh, everything that's been said so far is so very important. Patients and families participating in root cause analysis is absolutely vital to finding out the root cause of a problem that took the life or did harm to a patient. So I, I am totally in favor of that, have always been there, and I applaud you, Dan, for your work in this. Arlene, the bullying is such a big issue. In my own personal experience, I've known nurses um, and when I lost my mother due to health care harm and other nurses who wanted very much to speak out but were terrified um, because of this bullying issue, because of this systematic bullying issue. We need to change the system to one where it's a safe place for a, 
a employee or a provider, a clinician to go and, and, and vent their fears and their problems with problems that are happening in the system. We don't have that available. We don't have that kind of support out there for these uh, providers. And we need to do that. Our healthcare system needs to catch up with the 21st century. We're doing all this great stuff with technology. But as far as the human factor, we still have nurses going into the bathroom in hospitals all over the nation every single day crying their eyes out because they can't do something about something they felt wasn't right. This has to change. And lastly, my greatest passion is support services for people who have experienced health care harm or lost loved ones to it. We don't, the medical system in and of itself, I would like to see the future of the medical system find a way to to support these people. Of course, it's controversial. There's always threats of lawsuits here and there, but I think with full disclosure, patient participation, and, and, and lowering the expectations of patients and families where they don't think something is a cure-all or a panacea, that's really the way to change the way the system works. So I, I just want to thank you all for being here today, and um, those are my comments. Back to you, Dr. Great. Denham. Great, and we'll give you guys a chance uh, at the end. I, I'm trying to keep our comments fairly short so you all have a ch another chance to address these issues, but I want the entire audience to celebrate the folks' faces that you see on this page, because with, if it not wasn't for them, the hospital-acquired conditions would not have happened. We would not be seeing that potential impact. And the projections are that uh, by the end of 2019, there will be even more money saved and more lives saved. So we draw your attention to that. We're going to have the leaders of the ARC review study group uh, cover this this next year to really uh, uh, be able to uh, help us focus. One of the folks that couldn't be with us today is uh, Mary Foley. Mary was the uh, is one of the former presidents of the Na of the American Nursing Association. I got to speak with her today. Uh, she has also been a, a steadfast supporter, a leader of patient safety, and one who had personal harm. And these personal stories, like Dan's story and and the others, are are so critical. And she lost her mother to preventable harm. And instead of uh, getting bitter, she got better and helps us get better. Uh, Kyle, would you please roll Mary's account? comments. Mary, what a pleasure it is to have been working with you over these many years, and uh, again, your contribution to this effort with the hospital conditions and the NQSA practices and the many projects that you've worked on over the years and your wonderful position as an educator, a nurse, uh, uh, a real leader uh, in our national and global community. Um, can you tell us what you think are the big milestones or what we should be celebrating over the last 10 years? Well, Chuck, I think, thank you for inviting me to, to participate, and congratulations on um, 10 years of incredible work. Um, I'm, I'm most proud uh, as an individual, uh, not as a nurse, not as a faculty person, you know, not as, but as a consumer and a family member and a daughter of a, a mother who experienced harm. Um, the partner of a loved one who's gone through intense cancer treatment and done very well, and there were incredible safe practices that I had the privilege of observing. So I really uh, am most proud of any contract that helps someone else's family, loved one, and individuals because um, the, the expectation that care be patient-centered and as safe as possible um, really has to remain one of our priorities. So that, that brings me great pride and, you know, that our voices help be a, a collective message of how important, um, you know, validating the, the hospital-acquired conditions and, and sticking to them and making sure that there were, there, that there's enforcement and that there's fees and penalties associated with them. That, that's why, why the hospitals took them seriously. Until then, they didn't, and now they will. Well, thank you, Mary, and thank you for your contribution and uh, steadfast support. Now, as we look at 2019 and beyond, what tactical, practical focus areas would you like us to concentrate on as we look at the next year, the webinars and the programs that we'll be, uh, that we'll be supporting? I, I'm really interested in taking uh, patient and family involvement to the next level. Um, I, I know there's a lot of talk, and I've been to a couple of programs where they talk about the structure of a patient family advisory council. They spend a lot of time on just the structure, but I want to have folks talk about the purpose, the meeting, the, the real involvement, true involvement, transparency throughout 
um, the, the whole structure at the board level to the um, service level and really making come alive the voice of the individual, the patient, and the family. Um, so I think that's, that's our job for the next few years, to you know, do something dramatic and make it more than just a committee, make it a meaningful, impactful role for patients and families who care about themselves and their loved ones to have a voice, to have a vote, and to have a presence in our health care system. Well, thank you, Mary. I, and that you just remind me of the terrific meetings that we attended uh, at the Mayo Clinic with their group and how thoughtful and how contributive that uh, the consumers were. Mary, thank you for your uh, wonderful support of patient safety and your great work uh, uh, on the West Coast. Thank you. It's been an honor and a privilege to work with you, Chuck, and the great team you've assembled. So thank you for letting me say a few words. Bye. So next is, uh, and so thank you guys for uh, uh, being so great to work with. Every other week uh, we meet uh, Saturday mornings. Uh, the Mayo Clinic topic is a segue to Roger Resar. Dr. Roger Resar, an enormous contributor to patient safety in so many ways, just if you listed on the slide uh, through 27, uh, high reliability flow, original foundational work with IHI. I met him almost 20 years ago at IHI and we were part of the medication management uh, team and went on to work on many things together, the, uh, many of the uh, things that you've seen come out of the Institute for Healthcare Improvement where Roger and just a small team of six or seven people, and I was on to be on those teams uh, uh, focused on areas of medication management and, uh, and, and so many of the things that we see uh, today. And uh, Roger is also one of the funniest, one of the most brilliant, one of the most exciting, and one of the most fascinating guys uh, that I've ever worked with. And he told me now in his retirement, he's a freshly minted pilot, uh, and, uh, but he formerly was an internist and a critical care doctor at Luther Middleford Hospital, and he'll briefly tell the the story of, reconcili uh, of medication reconciliation and what uh, we should celebrate. So Roger, it's such a thrill to talk to you and we've had so much fun working on patient safety and quality together and I think back on the wonderful contributions that you've brought in the last decade, but one of the first ones I want to ask you about is, is uh, medication reconciliation and how that evolved and how we can celebrate the great work that you did and Jane Justison and that story. Can you tell it real quick for us? Well, you're making me look old here, Chuck. Uh, it was a happenstance and it was an opportunity because Jane Justison, a nurse, said, you know what the real problem here is? We're not talking to each other. We're not understanding what medications the patients have when they come into the hospital and when we order their first set of orders or when we discharge them from the hospital or even when we transfer them within the hospital. As a physician, I did not believe this. We evaluated 50 charts, and I can't recall the number of errors, but there were a huge number of errors in just going from the patient's uh, medications that were taken on the outside and the medications that were ordered on the inside uh, and the orders that were on the inside that never went to the outside again. So that was the birth of medication reconciliation. As a physician, I was blind to the problem. As a nurse, Jane Justison saw this as a huge issue. And as you know, this has become a staple now in hospitals around the world where attention is being placed on something called medication reconciliation. Well, it, it was so exciting to, to, to then ha see your championship of Jane and, and, uh, and Bill Rupp's support because didn't you guys then, uh, Jane defended it as a poster at an IHI meeting and Lucian Lee picked up on it and then the rest is history, isn't that right? Well, yeah, I mean, the, the funny part of it is Lucian, uh, you know, who is a master at uh, the, the safety work uh, years ago and who's the grandfather of safety, uh, looked at us and said, I've never heard of that as a problem. 
and he fell into the same trap that I fell into as a physician. We did not recognize the problem, but someone who was on the ground uh, level taking care of these patients saw that as a problem. And listening to her, this then became uh, a, a force that had to be dealt with over the years. And in fact, a few years after we started this, the Joint Commission then required that medication reconciliation be part of a safety project in hospital. So yeah, it did go a long way, and it was fun. Well, uh, had it not been for your leadership of putting somebody up uh, uh, and encouraging them and Bill uh, Rupp uh, doing it, that wouldn't have happened. And uh, so congratulations. The other, the other one I'm going to ask you about is Flo and this, this, uh, this wonderful work that you started and then brought forth and is continuing to pay great dividends. Tell us about that. Well, it's a long story. It's a, it's a decade-long story, but it's, felt, it's fraught with frustration. And the frustration was that we saw very little improvement in flow when we looked at the large projects that people were doing. And it dawned on us that what we were missing was an administrative system, a system that allowed for the introduction of basic uh, flow science in the work that we're doing in hospital flow. That is understanding cue theory, understanding traffic patterns, understanding what's happening with, uh, with our uh, uh, patients during the course of a day. And we came up with a administrative system called real-time demand capacity, which we have been now implementing across the country in hospitals and seeing dramatic results as a result of just going back to the basics of understanding demand and capacity. Well, you just did uh, such a great job at bringing passion to the party uh, and uh, your work at Mayo and your ability to really get people to focus on this was terrific and your enthusiasm uh, and intellect just permeated everything and, and we just want to thank you. My last question for you is what do you think we need to focus on that's tactical, practical that we can get our arms around for the next decade? What would you recommend from your, from, from your vantage point? From my vantage point, uh, I'm looking at it now as a retired person, okay? And I, Chuck, to be honest with you, I don't have any good ideas, okay? I'm going to have to leave it at that. You know what? You've had so many great ones, and if we just keep building on your great ideas of the last decade, I think that uh, gives us some so, some great targets. Uh, you thank you so much for your mentorship of all of us, and uh, you know you brought such joy to our collaborations with IHI and the work that you have done. We just want to thank you for just a great body of work. Well, you're very welcome. It's nice talking to you. <laughs> So uh, the takeaway from Roger Resar to me is that we can uh, learn so much from our frontline caregivers and giving them a chance. The part that uh, Roger didn't say was that uh, Jane Justison was a staff nurse. Her mom was uh, perpetually going to die of heart disease and kept being readmitted and living longer than anyone had thought. She put together a grid on medications and and uh, Dr. Resar said, you know, you should, you should publicize that at an IHI meeting. And she goes, oh, I'm just a staff nurse. I, I couldn't do that. I, you need to do it. And Roger refused, and he, he and Bill Rupp insisted that a staff nurse defend a poster at an IHI meeting, and had they not, there would not be med reconciliation. And it just goes to show how much learning that we can have. And the takeaway today is frontline nurses can teach us so much, and there's work that we could put put to work, which leads me to IHI, and there are so many great leaders, Carol Harridan right now, who's now retired, Frank Federico was on our team, uh, I called to congratulate Don Berwick yesterday, uh, and we recorded uh, uh, Frank Federico, who's now Vice President and Senior Patient Safety Expert at IHI, but we have so much to be thankful for in the last decade of the great work of the 100,000 Lives Campaign, 5 Million Lives Campaign. Frank has been a long-standing and steadfast champion of 
patient safety. He's made enormous contributions. We've worked with him over the last 20 years on many, many medication reconciliation uh, projects, the, the Quantum Leaps medication uh, project, and uh, his ability uh, to actually synthesize uh, the information and data and apply it much in a much broader way than medication management is uh, goes to show the performance improvement methods that IHI employed. So uh, we have uh, a quick quote from Frank, Freda, Frank, Frank Federico representing this great team at IHI. So Frank, it's been so exciting working with you at IHI over the last even more than 10 years, but as we look back at the last decade, what should we be celebrating as the high impact things that we've done? So, uh, Chuck, again, thank you for your support and all the great work you've done to improve patient safety. I think we've learned how to address some of the infections, which up until not too long ago, they were considered the cost of doing business. That's what happens. You get a ventilator-associated pneumonia. You get a central line infection. And now we see hospitals that have been able to go for hundreds of days without those particular infections. And I think that those are things that we need to celebrate. We also need to celebrate how we've learned to engage the patient, where before we were doing things to the patient, now we're planning with the patient. And for the future, I think what's really important for us to consider is how do we sustain the gains that we've made. And a lot of it has to do with the culture that we develop in organizations, has to do with the ability for us to not slide back as the technology changes, as patient population changes, as there's different stresses put on the healthcare system, that ultimately we're always as for the patient. We're always trying to provide good and safe care for the patients. And I think uh, the more we work on the culture, the more we work on making sure that things are sustainable, the more we can continue to celebrate the great successes we've had. Well, thank you so much, Frank, and for your wonderful leadership. I can think of the Quantum Leaps uh, program that we worked on together for medication management, and now you are working around the world on medication management. Can you give us some of those highlights? Yeah, so, you know, we started with focusing on the high alert medications because we said if you can't get it right for those medications, then why everything else? Because every other medication can cause harm, but the high alert the most. And we've learned, however, that that only gets you so far. And along with the work of the WHO, the World Health Organization, third challenge around medication safety, we are now looking at how we can engage even in lower middle income countries and help them to provide safer medication management and making sure that their patients are getting the right care at the right time in a safe way. So there's great opportunity to learn how not only to work in large prosperous countries, but really to work in the lower middle income countries, which really need our support more than anything. Well, it's so great to talk to you, and you talk about sustaining the gains, and this audience uh, uh, will be hearing uh, from Jenny McBride and the organ donorship program, which actually IHI uh, had such a fundamental role in helping, and the gains have been sustained. So I'm certain that there's a lot more work that you and IHI have done that is being sustained. So thank you so much for your contribution. And thank you for all your support. So that leads into Jenny McBride. Now, this is not a name that a lot of us in the patient safety movement would know, but behind the scenes, a terrific leader. Uh, the uh, Dennis Wagner is one of the one of our greatest leaders, and he happens to work in the government and embrace the methodologies of IHI. IHI was a major advisor to the drug uh, to the donor uh, the organ donor collaborative that I had the privilege of participating in, and uh, my role was working with all the hospital CEOs and then taking our TMIT organization and harnessing it to help them with an IHI type collaborative collaborative of all of the organ procurement organizations and hospitals focused on converting at that time a terrible waiting list of 17 people every day were dying without organs and the goal was to increase the organ donorship increase the conversion increase the number of organs that could be donated per uh, per donor and uh, when we realized it was a great opportunity I asked uh, Jenny whether she would co-write with me a new safe practice for the NQF on uh, organ donorship, and we were able to effectively get that through the NQF process, uh, and we'll hear from Jenny now. So please uh, play uh, Jenny's comment. 
Jenny, it's so great to be with you today, uh, now years after we worked together on the National Quality Forum Safe Practice for Transplantation. Uh, tell us what we should be celebrating today and, uh, and, and why this has been so successful. Well, it's great to talk to you, Chuck, and to have the opportunity to reflect back on where we've been over the last 10 years. And the, the really excellent headline is that organ donation and transplantation increases uh, are continuing. Uh, we have sustained the best practices that we learned um, through you and other experts around the country, and they are continuing to be applied and influencing a whole new generation of practitioners in our field. The number of organ donors in the U.S. has exceeded 10,000 for the first time, and the number of organs transplanted in the U.S. is uh, 32,000. And we are within grasp of the goal we set of 35,000 organs transplanted in a year. So that is really exciting. I think what's really um, contributed to our uh, success is the fact that we have a terrifically defined set of best practices and a regulatory environment that allows us to focus on those great metrics and practices and um, working with the federal government, we can assure that we are putting those best practices into action. That's fantastic, and the goals that we set for the safe practice that you and I wrote together have been, have been maintained, is that right? That's right, that's right. Uh, we continue to teach those best practices. Uh, they are written into accreditation standards and regulations and and other best practice documents that we share throughout the country. So they are, they're very much a part of, of who this community is now. Fantastic. And now as we look in the future, we want to give the audience, what are the high impact areas to focus on going forward that are practical and tactical? And what, what are the exciting things that you can challenge us uh, to be doing in the next decade? Well, I think the, the exciting uh, challenge for organ donation and transplantation in the 10 years is how do we apply new innovations and therapies and technologies to improve the health of organs, to modify or um, pharmaceutically treat organs so that they can perform better in transplant patients. And in order for us to be able to do things, we are going to do these things, we are going to be able to take advantage of the best practice infrastructure that uh, you all helped us create so that we can disseminate uh, things that work to our community and get organ procurement organizations and transplant centers to adopt them as quickly as possible. So, you know, technology is really going to be the key for us in the next 10 years, and I, I think it's going to be revolutionary for organ donation and transplant. Leadership is so critical, and I think it was so exciting to work with people like Dennis Wagner and Paul McGann and you and, and how you embraced some of the greatest principles of leadership. Any comments on how that contributed to your success? Well, you know, what I keep coming back to is um, focus on more of what you want. And when you see um, high-performing organizations and when you see people who are doing things in a thoughtful and productive way and achieving great outcomes, celebrate them put them out in front of everyone and, and let everyone have the opportunity to emulate what it is that, that we're seeing that, uh, that, that gets the results that we want. So, you know, catch, catch someone doing something right and share it with others, and I think that that's been, I think that's really been one of the secrets of the success of, of our collaborative work. It was so exciting to watch teams learn something from a great story and watch them go out into the halls at the breaks, calling home and telling people what they could do to change right away. Wasn't that exciting? It really was exciting, and I think what was even more exciting is when they came back at the next meeting or on a subsequent conference call, and they could, com they could claim progress, they could claim victory, and the, the, um, the, the, the feelings of pride and excitement and success that were created uh, became addictive, and people just tried to find more and more experiences where they could be successful. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much, Jenny. It was a great pleasure talking to you, and thanks for remembering us. So.
Jenny McBride uh, is uh, now a CEO of one of the Oregon procurement organizations. I had the opportunity of talking to Dennis Wagner yesterday, who actually led the program. Uh, and the, bad, the good news is there are many more organs. The bad news is there are so many opioid overdose deaths that we now have more organs. And so that's, uh, it's really a mixed blessing. Uh, uh, and this is why we've got to champion the cause of opioid overdose, uh, which we'll hear a little bit more about when we talk talk about the MedTech program. So Esprit de Corps was definitely what we saw in these collaboratives that actually were inspired by IHI. And Dr. Steven Swenson, one of our dearest friends of patient safety and one of my dearest friends, is the, uh, also won the, the Pete Conrad Global Patient Safety Award, as did our patient advocates who have, you've heard of earlier, Dan Ford and the rest of the group. Um, and Dr. Swenson uh, is writing the book, and a book will be released the third quarter of this next next year uh, regarding esprit de corps and burnout. Uh, Dr. Um, Swenson is in Germany now, and we could not get a, a, a time that would work for him to actually get him, him uh, on, uh, on uh, as a recording. But we wanted to let you know, he, after his 30 years serving at the Mayo Clinic, he continues to be a, a fellow at the IHI. He was uh, the, actually the chair of radiology, became the director of quality, continued to read CT scans right until his very last day. He was, also, he was a pulmonary CT expert uh, who had wrote multiple books and focused on that. Very humble. You would never know it. And then he went on to develop uh, the leadership and organizational development for Mayo Clinic, and we are having him back in 2019 regarding burnout and the direct correlation between burnout and patient safety. And you see his nice comments regarding congratulating us on serving patients over the last 10 years, but on the future, he states, one patient wish is that we could all take care of each other, because if we are well, patients will experience fewer medical errors and benefit from superior outcomes and relationships with professionals. He is really digging into the mathematical evidence-based impact of burnout at the front line and doing a terrific job. Now, Steve Swenson introduced me uh, years ago to a young female physician at the Mayo Clinic who is a hospitalist and uh, championing a cause uh, of mortality reviews, which is really kind of a controversial area, to actually look at charts an hour, an hour and a half, and identify the, the, uh, the causes of mortality and really pulling the curtain back and exposing ourselves to what we could have done better. Um, Jean met with the, the board of the Cleveland Clinic and presented her information, and they said, we really need to see good data analysis, as any board should ask. And what did Jean do? She went back and got an engineering degree and a degree in measurement and in data and uh, is now, I believe, our next Don Berwick. And Jean Adelston uh, uh, wrote an article uh, which uh, I helped get published that focused on these uh, mortality reviews with the Journal of Patient Safety. And it's now been one that has really uh, helped us understand that, that uh, the difference between omission and commission and uh, how we can improve uh, our, our care. So she is really the global champion and global expert on mortality reviews, and we have a short recording from Dr. Huddleston. Yes. So, Jean, your work has just been absolutely breakthrough. Uh, our audience has loved every one of the presentations. They want you to come back. Your mortality review work, we believe, is one of the biggest milestones in the last decade. Uh, what do you think we should celebrate in the last decade? And then I'll ask you the question about the future. Jean, what do you think? I think one of the most exciting things in our work is that we have started to redefine what should be considered patient safety by removing concepts of preventability and blame and peer review. We've been able to recognize that more than 85% of what we're learning now that we can actually do something about are the acts of omission, not commission, which include everything from suffering of end of life to delayed or misdiagnoses, which ultimately lead to delays in treatment. Well, great. And, and you know, I, I have to tell you, I've been always eternally gra uh, grateful to Steve Swenson for introducing us and having the opportunity to review your article, your first article addressing this. And what, a, what, what, an exciting, what an exciting time. Thank you for your great work. What do you think we should be focused on in 2019 and beyond? 
In 2019, John is taking some of the work that's been happening around learning from death and actually start learning from living. So many of the problems that we didn't think that we could solve before, like mortality rates, people have actually been able to figure out which process and system failures are impeding their providers from doing their best job and therefore contributing to mortality. I think we can turn that same organizational learning lens on other issues that we have not been able to solve, like readmissions or return to OR uh, unexpectedly after surgery or transitions of care to the outpatient setting or any of those sorts of things that we continue to sort of struggle with, throw resources and people at, but never seem to move the needle. If we actually go at things with a system lens, an organizational learning perspective, and learn from our patients, then I think we can break and crack some of those codes that we've been able to, unable to code. Basically, one of the things that we've been able to, to say over and over again at each of the sites that we work with is every life matters, both the patients and the providers. Fantastic. Well, I know you've got some publications in the pipeline to come out shortly, and we really are excited to have you come back in 2019 and keep educating us. Last question. We're thrilled with your collaborative network. How big do you have it? How big is your collaborative, and, and, and what is the representation now? So we're up to um, 106 hospitals between Canada, Australia, and the United States. We have at least 50 that are in the works right now going through the approval processes. So we anticipate we'll be somewhere between um, three and 400 hospitals strong by the end of 2019. Fantastic. Congratulations, Jean. Keep up the Thank great you. work. So, uh, and Jean just continues to drive the needle. We will see, you know, every hospital should consider mortality reviews in it and, and evaluate whether to start a program. Uh, the, the next person is, is Nancy Conrad. Nancy is the widow uh, of the former astronaut Pete Conrad, who passed away from the, the systems failure in an emergency uh, department and the pre-emergency care. Uh, she's the founder of the Conrad Foundation. And over the years, uh, a few people have had the honor of the Pete Conrad Global Patient Safety Award. They've included Don Berwick and the head of the Agency for Healthcare Quality Quality and Research and NQF and Joint Commission for their collaboration on the safe practices uh, and working with us with the LeapFrog Group. Uh, then over the years, others have won the award, including Steve uh, Swenson and Dan Ford, Jennifer Dingman, uh, uh, um, Arlene Salamandra, uh, and uh, Mary Foley, who you heard, and uh, Becky uh, uh, Martins as well. Uh, Nancy has continued to be a champion of patient safety uh, and works with uh, now over a million young people around the world with the Conrad Foundation. Uh, and we have a short uh, recording of Nancy. Nancy, it's such a great pleasure to visit with you today, and I can't believe how long we've uh, collaborated and worked together in patient safety. I just want to acknowledge you on behalf of our network for your great support of patient safety in honor of Pete, the Pete Conrad Award, and you too participated in our grassroots effort on the hospital-acquired conditions. And so we just want to thank you for your steadfast support and just ask you, what should we be celebrating over the last 10 years? Well, I think we've made some progress, Chuck. Um, certainly there's lives that have been saved, and we have um, shined a light on, on the situation and the, the challenge that is there to be solved. Um, so it's very gratifying to see that there is some progress. And, uh, you know, that's <laughs> who was it that used to say progress, our most important progress? Well, you know, saving lives is, is an incredibly important uh, offshoot of the work that we've done together over the years. And it's very gratifying to know that you and your team and all the work that we've done together has actually had an impact and has actually created some change. So that's all good. Very, well, very exciting. 
Nancy, you've given us some great, uh, great quotes. Uh, you often say we spend too much time in healthcare admiring the problem, and uh, <laughs> yeah. you may not have a PhD, but a GSD uh, gets stuff yeah. done. And so <laughs> now, let me ask you this: What are the practical and tactical things you think we need to go after in 2019 and beyond? I know you're very passionate about a pre-emergency and emergency care in light of Pete's uh, Pete's passing. And uh, you've never left that area of how important that is as well. Right. And I, I think that there are some really amazing people working in that sector. You know, the opportunities that technology provides to expand it, not only in width but in depth the kind of care that can happen for people in emergency environments I think is a huge opportunity right now. And I'd, I'd like to see even more progress being made in that so that more lives could be saved. Um, you know, I t I'll give you my new quote, Chuck. You're going to love this one. Uh, you know, we work with students all over the world, and healthcare is one of the categories that we work in, and we've been involved in many of your efforts with, with young people, bringing them into the environment of being part of the solution for healthcare and actually saving lives within schools and having young people participate in the whole emergency uh, spectrum that can happen in schools, unfortunately, in today's world. And so I always talk about, you know, we have to leave a better world for our children, but we also have to leave better children for our world. And doing the kind of work that you're doing with young people and the work that we do with young people in our Conrad Challenge is the opportunity to, as you would say, pay it forward and to really create opportunities and to save lives so that the kinds of deaths that have happened over the years from medical error can decrease even more and perhaps at some point just be eradicated. I mean, error, I don't know if that could ever go away, but certainly we can reduce the incidence of it. And I think today's technologies that are growing so exponentially can be part of that solution. So it'll be interesting and exciting and challenging to see what happens and what young people create to solve these challenges. So I look forward to that. Well, thank you, Nancy, and uh, we're so appreciative. Uh, you've been relentless in pursuing the goal, and uh, God bless you for all of your work. Oh, God bless you, Chuck. Thank you for bringing me into the scenario and into the conversation and helping me to learn how to uh, be part of the solution. And you're right, I don't like to admire problems. Well, Nancy, uh, um bestows the Pete Conrad Global Patient Safety Award, not every year, and only when there are folks that really uh, uh, she believes and that uh, folks at NASA and those in her collaborative network believe are important. Uh, we all know Sorrell King. Sorrell was a winner this year of the 2018 award for her wonderful work in the Josie King Foundation, and we'll be having Sorrell come to speak to us in 2019 regarding leveraging the patient stories and the story of Josie and the impact that it's had. Sue Sheridan won the award as well for her terrific work, and we know that there will be breakthrough papers that are coming down the pipe right now on misdiagnosis, and so we don't want to steal her thunder or the thunder of the organization that she's joined, uh, And uh, but we do know that uh, misdiagnosis is going to be a very hot topic in 2019, and we're waiting for the leaders to be able to have their pulp their papers published to do that. It brings us to Heather Foster, who was one of the folks that whose name is not as well known in patient safety, but was selected by Nancy because of her championship of speaking truth to power, representing nurses to do the right thing, to take the high road when bad events occur. Uh, she, uh, uh, the details won't be uh, made known at this point in time, but uh, she championed the cause of nurses and patients and went to bat uh, for uh, a patient and family after a death occurred with uh, sepsis, and um, we coupled her uh, story with 
uh, with input from Cynthia Shapiro, who's a former HR leader, who is teaching us how to develop better best practices, more ethical best practices after an event occurs. Because a phenomenon has occurred in healthcare institutions where HR has become weaponized as a defensive organization or an internal organization that is more concerned with preserving the financial uh, uh, health of an organization than, than its, its, its employees. And uh, there's a huge opportunity for ethic, ethical work, and we'll be going to Bill uh, uh, we're, we'll be going to uh, uh, the chief security officer for MD Anderson, who is, I think, one of the most moral men that and, and godly men that we could really look to who is championing this kind of a cause at one of our greatest cancer centers, we'll, who we'll hear from in, in, in just a few minutes. But, Heather, we're so grateful to have you uh, with us. And uh, just a brief comment regarding uh, your message to nurses and caregivers and doctors and frontline folks about taking the high road when it seems like all the cards are stacked against you. Heather? Heather, are you muted? So, We'll wait for Heather to come on here in a minute, but just to, to explain what I'm talking about, when these challenges occur in your healthcare institution uh, and uh, uh, thing, th things just are not going well after an adverse event, uh, critically important that we, no matter what happens, that we take the high road in everything we do, put patients and families first. And Heather was recognized by Nancy Conrad and the organization for her terrific uh, uh, personal uh, story and uh, exemplifying taking that high road, uh, in, and w she will be a future speaker in the uh, in the days to come. Uh, uh, a program has been launched called the Healthcare Innocence Project. There'll be more in 2019 on that, and one of our greatest academic organizations will be one of the collaborators with this program. It builds on the idea and the and the principle of taking a new technology like the Innocence Project has using DNA 25 years ago which was a new technology, in order to demonstrate the innocence of people that might be wrongly convicted or wrongly accused. This is uh, an approach of using electronic records and with great insights from people like John Nance, who will speak shortly, uh, be able to use the evidentiary support from the AHR and from the HR records uh, to be able to help develop the defenses uh, for uh, frontline caregivers so that they know that they have the comfort of knowing that uh, that there can be a more just culture. And we've had a terrific uh, uh, amount of input from David Marks and case studies in this area, which you'll hear more of in the, in, in the days to come. That brings us to, uh, to uh, two great gentlemen who are going to speak today, one on recording and the other is one of our speakers uh, who will speak briefly uh, uh, live. And uh, these are uh, Dr. Greg Boats and uh, Bill Adcox, part of the MedTAC team. And we're so grateful somebody so close to us would actually honor the, this team, uh, the MedTAC team, that developed the Medical Tactical uh, Certificate Program. Uh, this is a program that uh, really got started with conversations at Texas Medical Center with Dr. Greg Boats, who you see on the left, and uh, Chief uh, Bill Adcox, who's the Chief Security Officer and Chief of Police at the University of Texas uh, at MD Anderson Cancer Center, and evolved from the beginnings of an active shooter program for healthcare, which I was asked to help put together, to now what is now operating in four states, uh, where we've got pilots going in four states in pre-hospital care of the eight leading causes of death. Uh, and Dr. Greg Boats, uh, we really championed this cause. Uh, he's a critical care physician, an educator, a researcher, uh, who's been a director of the Simulation Center at MD Anderson, chief medical officer for the police department, working with uh, Chief Adcox. And we have a brief recording of Dr. Boats. Greg, you've been a wonderful contributor to our webinars and yet such high responses in our net promoter scores, and uh, we have an avid audience that really listens to you. You've been one of the pioneers of this idea of the MedTAC program and uh, impacting uh, uh, care. Uh, what can you share with us about what we should celebrate regarding what we've been learning in the last decade, and then what should we focus on or could focus on in the future? 
Well, Chuck, I think uh, I want to offer my congratulations to you for 10 years of fantastic webinars that have added to the body of patient safety uh, knowledge and skills on the part of our practitioners. I think what we've learned over the last 10 years is that we can use tools from other industries that have had a vested interest in safety and implement them in our clinical settings in order to provide a safer, uh, more efficient healthcare delivery system. I think that the major contribution has been the ability of people at the front line to learn the theory and skills of quality improvement to make changes in their own environment that add to patient safety. And I think when we look to the future, one area that we can concentrate on is using those advantages, those gains that we've made in patient safety to make it safety for our caregivers and their families in our community. Fantastic. You know, you've had uh, and been passionate about the idea of even our faith-based organizations developing rapid response teams to potential mass casualty events, be they active shooter, earthquake, or some other disaster. Do you want to kind of comment on that? I think it's a fabulous idea, and as, as you know, because of your inspiration there, we're, we're tackling that now. Well, absolutely. I think that one of the early projects that I was involved in in my hospital was the implementation of a rapid response team to try to identify patients at risk and intervene early when the opportunity to have a good outcome was greatest. I think that that approach also translates into some of the various groups in our community where people gather. So faith-based organizations that meet regularly in, uh, in church or in temple or in other areas for various functions can use the rapid response team model to take care of themselves, to identify their own uh, members who might be uh, at risk for medical problems and intervene early. Provide a safety net for those people that gather uh, for their faith-based activities. Uh, but there are many of the members who are healthcare providers who can add to the safety of their group by paying attention to people with diabetes or people with hypertension, people on complex medical uh, management strategies who, if identified, you can check on them uh, during the day to make sure they're doing okay to avoid someone who may have a high blood sugar, a low blood sugar, a high blood pressure, a low blood pressure, anything that might be a threat to their safety. Fantastic. Well, listen, thank you for your continued uh, championship of patient safety across all uh, of these sectors, and uh, uh, we really appreciate it. Thank you so much, Greg. So, Dr. Boats uh, really championed the cause of the active shooter uh, program at Texas Medical Center and then further work with uh, Chief Adcox, who you'll hear from next. Uh, the MedTAC program, which you see on slide 45, uh, is uh, evolved, and we'll put resources regarding that at, this, at that point in time. And, Bill, because we want to move to, uh, to John Nance quickly, what I'd like you to do is just address, Bill, uh, this idea of threat safety science, and then when we come back during our reaction period, we'll move to the slide of moving left of boom and get into a little bit more detail, because I know you'll enjoy commenting on what, uh, what John says. Can, uh, chief Adcox is the chief of police, uh, the chief security officer at the University of, uh, uh, of Texas at MD Anderson Cancer Center. Uh, I talk to Bill almost every single day. He is a, just a, an amazing champion of doing the right thing, and really, you know, at one of the great organizations. MD Anderson, where I had the privilege of training, uh, we've got one of, I think, the greatest champions of patient safety, caregiver safety, and safety of the entire uh, administration. Bill, do you want to kind of tell us just a quick comment regarding the threat safety spectrum, and then we'll come back to uh, left of boom after John speaks. Uh, yes, thank you very much, <clears throat> Dr. Denham. So what you see up here is this, the uh, prevention, preparedness, protection, performance improvement. That's our shared purpose. But what we look at is when it comes to threat safety science is there's threat, risk, harm, and crime. And when we talk about the spectrum, you're talking about an ever-changing environment where, where this, this particular spectrum where it's just exploding. So you're seeing greater frequency, greater velocity, and frankly, greater harm. And so it doesn't matter if it's coming from inside or external uh, threats. It doesn't matter if it's visible or invisible. It can be man-made, can be, can be natural. 
uh, you have to have a systems approach. You have to be looking at leadership practice technologies around the spectrum, thinking about things in terms of organizational health and individual wellness. So you're really taking a, a, a thought process that mirrors what we're talking about this entire uh, webinar around, you know, having multidisciplinary uh, cross-functional teams. So you were talking about patients and the caregivers. In other words, it's a holistic approach and it's all about wellness. So uh, the threat safety science, I think, is, is left to boom. It's, it's getting out in front of these issues. This is exactly what we're trying to do. This is where MedTech comes into play because it's allowed bystander care uh, to, to step up and be the first first responders, and it helps us in many, many ways. So I, I, I'm really appreciative of being part of this, and I thank everybody for all your contributions to making things safer and better and, and saving lives. Well, thank you so much, Chief, and we'll come back to you right after John, and then we'll come back to Dan Ford and the rest of the reactors after John speaks. So John is just, uh, uh, you know, we've heard a lot, a lot of uh, comments from fabulous people, and there's just no one like John Nance. Uh, he is a, uh, a, a pilot. He is a safety leader, a journalist. Uh, he is someone who I think leads the charge in a moral way of looking at patient safety and quality. He's always somebody we, we can we can and rely on no matter what. Uh, you, you know, it could go on and on of the stories of the people that John behind the scenes is helping in addition to speaking to us on a, with the broad uh, journalistic approach as well as being a champion of the, of the cause of patient safety, caregiver safety, and really coming back to this whole area of threat safety science that the Chief just addressed. Uh, John will be one of the invited leaders to be involved in a global summit that we're co-hosting with the, the WHO uh, next year that will include threat safety science in the fall of 2019 uh, in Geneva. And John, thank you so much for helping us now really kind of focus on this magic accountability, all the things we've talked about celebrating and all the things we talk about going forward. Without accountability and leadership, we're, we, we have nothing. And so, John, uh, could you finish us up today and then we'll come back to our reactors. Absolutely, Chuck, and it's always an honor to be on these, and I appreciate everybody on the other end listening. Uh, I may have to ask for you to advance the slides uh, manually here. I don't seem to have a switch. Uh, the, I was going to talk real briefly, very briefly, about uh, the two books that uh, that are out there that White Hospitals Should Fly, uh, which was basically to set a paradigm for what the perfect hospital would look like. And uh, and then the follow-on book that I wrote with uh, my wife, Kathleen Bartholomew, who's a nurse, which was uh, uh, basically to kind of give people a step-by-step -step on how to take the principles involved in why hospitals should fly in and actually make them work. And there's a lot of academic backup in, uh, in charting the course, too. Not, not that many people really understand that charting the course is a follow-on from that book. But uh, let me move on, though, because one of the ones, one of the things I wanted to say uh, is this, and I've said this to a lot of audiences over the last number of years, and I'm not sure they completely understand that the sacred bond between a doctor, the hospital, a nurse, anybody in healthcare, anybody in healthcare, and the patient is traditionally the trust that the doctor or any of those people would do his or her best to to provide the best that they could to the patient's best interest. It's no longer enough. It is not enough professionally, ethically, morally, and even legally. Today, the trust has to be that the doctor, the nurse, the healthcare center is going to provide the best medical care available for medical science, or as the way I like to put it, the best that medical science can advise. And that means that we have to turn around and say, well, if you're not doing that, then uh, to what degree are you accountable for not doing that? And accountability is a very important thing here. Um, this is a rough definition uh, that basically I cobbled together. It's not Webster's Seventh, but I think it, it hits the mark. The fact of being responsible for your actions and words this is the definition of accountable. And the willingness to give an honest reason for such actions and words, regardless of whether the reasons were good, bad, or for that matter, corrupt. Uh, that's that's accountable. That's what it means to be accountable, and accountability is the, the art and the heart and soul of being accountable. Spewing bald-faced lies about important matters and refusing to admit that they are lies 
is the opposite of accountability. Whether such actions involve an HR director caught using HR as a weapon against employees, which doesn't happen all that often, but happens too much, raising safety issues, uh, you know, when somebody does that and then they get hit with a sit down, shut up, and oh, by the way, we're going to put something in your record, even though we're not going to admit it was fraudulent, or whether we're talking about the highest levels of government, and we well, that could be an anthology for another day. Accountability is also having the integrity and the willingness to admit that a policy, a procedure, a method of running a hospital, anything has been shown to be less than best practice, or maybe it's been shown to be flat out wrong, and the willingness to admit that a change is needed and to make that change rather than circling the wagons and saying, oh, we can't admit that because the legal department tells us not to. Now, there are times, and I say this as a lawyer, that you've got to sit down with your chief legal counsel and say, look, your job is to advise us not to run this place. We decide what risks to take. And I made this point very clearly in, the, in both of those books. Uh, in aviation, the NTSB is the organization that really does the best job of providing a check on attempts to escape accountability. And the ingrained ethos of pilots has become a searing search for the truth wh wherever it lands. You all remember this next picture. This is uh, Sully landing on the Hudson. We always uh, refer to that. No, let's go back. I guess I missed it. There we go, right there. Uh, we uh, kind of refer to this as the inauguration of nonstop service between LaGuardia and the Hudson that didn't work out well for U.S. Air. But there was a lot about this accident, and including the aftermath. Now, those of you who saw the movie, Sully, uh, I mean, actually, I've gotten to be friends with Sully, and I called him on this and said, hey, the NTSB is – is portrayed in this movie as, as having been r ripping you guys apart and, uh, and almost a, an inquisition with a swinging light bulb. That couldn't possibly have happened. And he says, no, it didn't happen. They didn't do that. We did that. That was part of our inherent accountability as pilots. Oh, my God, could we have made it back without engines to LaGuardia? Did we do something wrong? He said, we ate ourselves alive for almost 18 months before the information was finally validated that, no, we, we made the best choices. And we might not have, but the point was it wasn't the NTSB that put that accountability on it. It was the NTSB that put the spotlight on what the facts were and the crew itself had the wherewithal to talk about that accountability. And one of the reasons they did is because in aviation, it's not so much a matter of it's very public when we fail, although that's certainly true too, but that's inherent to the process of making sure we learn the lessons the first time. I've got this gentleman here as an autocratic captain. I usually put that slide up because I, when I started flying commercially with a company called Braniff International out of Dallas, that we saw a lot of these guys. It was the sit down, shut up, and when I want your advice, I'll ask for it type of thing. That's the total opposite of the way we are today. But the reason that the autocratic captain had to be abolished as a paradigm involved the same reasons that autocratic positions must change. No human can be perpetually perfect. And yet if we try to maintain the mythology that we are, we destroy honest accountability for the mistakes that will occur, which in turn means that we refuse to learn the lessons. We've got to stop training doctors and nurses to believe that they can be perfect because they can't. But what we can do is by expecting problems to be able to catch them, and that's why this phrase is so important. Dr. David Nash, a good friend of mine uh, who's the head of the uh, Jefferson um, uh, School of Public uh, uh, Health, in, uh, in Jefferson Medical in Philadelphia had said this, and I put this slide up constantly, care is never error-free, but it, we can make it harm-free, and that's exactly the point. Um, morale is also an incredible part of this, and you cannot get morale without accountability, because if an organization is known to lie up their sleeve about things until it becomes convenient or legally safe, this is equivalent to this sign. It's just stupid. The beatings will continue until morale improves. Uh, with love, team manager, and we've all seen this. I have to throw this in because a lot of you know that I talk about Star Trek and the difference between Kirk and Picard, Kirk being the autocratic leader, Picard being the guy who sits down and always is willing to listen and make a better decision as a result of being accountable for all the aspects of his fallibility as a human being, and that's an incredibly important thing. Let's go to the next slide, if you would. The um, this is the, uh, Jacob Van Zandt, Captain Van Zandt. Many of you have read the story. You've heard me talk about it. This fellow in 1977, before the date of March 27th, was the absolute epitome of a captain's captain. And uh, go ahead with the next slide, if you will. And this uh, particular scene was on a fog-shrouded ramp in a place called Tenerife just a few minutes before 570 people died as a result of these two airplanes colliding. The lesson out of that was that if we had refused to talk about 
the uh, and, and be accountable for in aviation. All the lessons that were inherent to that accident, over automation, for instance, in the face of, of, of uh, under training, is a current thing that we've got to pay attention to. In that case, it was the command leadership problem, the fact that the uh, the uh, pilot could not be questioned, not because he had said, "Don't talk to me." because he was a good guy, in fact, but because the culture had said that. And there were so many other aspects of this. When, when, you, when you do not lay accountability on the table as a bedrock basic, what we do is not learn the lessons, and we have to learn them over and over again, and people die to get that done. Uh, these tendencies are not exclusive to medicine, but they have no place in medicine. CEOs and hospital boards refusing to admit errors and refusing to admit harming patients or staff physically or through compromised reputations even to the point of guaranteeing lawsuits where none were necessary, is totally unacceptable. Physician leaders, CMOs, medical exec teams, refusing to accept newly discovered best practices and maintaining that established ways are best when they know that is not true is just unacceptable. And a, an example of that is refusing to impose standardization practices in the OR, such as checklist timeouts correctly uh, used universally marking the site and introduction to the team. These are known and proven best practices beyond debate, and yet they're rejected by too many who refuse to be accountable for the gap. And that is the ultimate accountability is simply this, which is basically, would you want this for your family? Because if you want a different standard for your family than you're willing to accept for everybody else, you've got an accountability problem, and you've got an honesty problem, and you've got an ethical problem. There's a lot more to be said about this, but let me also just mention a word that's going to frighten everybody, and that is criminal. There are certain circumstances in which people at various levels of authority, not only, uh, not only the C-suite, not just make mistakes, but when they know something is wrong and they refuse to do anything about it or become accountable for it, we are approaching the point of having to say as a society, should we make this clearly so onerous that we put criminal responsibility in place? And I believe that we should in certain circumstances. Not to say, okay, when somebody makes a mistake, or we're going to charge them criminally. That has nothing to do with it. It's when Mr. and Ms. CEO or COO or Mr. and Ms. the doctor, you knew a, B, and C was the situation. You knew that this individual was, was corrupt or was uh, impaired, and you let it go on anyway with the, uh, more or less malice of forethought. Uh, should there not be criminal responsibility for that? I certainly think there should. Accountability is what this is all about, and we have got to have a renaissance in our thinking in medicine in that area. Thank you, Chuck. Sorry, John. No problem. I'm no problem. ending to, here to give you a little bit of time at the end. Uh, I, I should say with dog and pilot on there, this was, by the way, what we used to say was the, what the uh, Airbus folks would like to have because they love to auto, automate, and that is a pilot and a dog would be the new commercial crew. The, dog, the job of the pilot is to feed the dog. The job of the dog is to bite the pilot if he attempts to turn off the auto flight system. It, it won't work. <laughs> Great, great comment, John. Uh, it looks like uh, uh, one of your slides uh, uh, wasn't included in the, uh, you know, in the end. And so, what I wanted to do now is, uh, is uh, I'm going to loop back to um, uh, Chief Adcox uh, just to give him a chance to talk about what left of boom means. Uh, because this is this prevention uh, issue that we're talking about, John, and have you react to what you, uh, what uh, Chief, please react to what John has said, and then we'll go to Dan and uh, Arlene and uh, Jenny as uh, our uh, real-time reactors. Okay. Chief, oh, thank you. Yes, thank you, Chuck. I think John is spot on, and uh, we just need to be more more transparent and open and, and, and go past proximate cause and look at some of the root causes and and how we can really, really deal with these issues. And, and I love that quote about, uh, you know, you can prevent harm, but you can't prevent all errors. But um, this particular slide, we call it the crisis continuum, and it is about getting left the boom. So what we're talking here is about the potential for an individual, let's say, that's, that's in the workplace that may, may commit uh, an atrocity or workplace violence. So what you have here is you have on the left is the escalating threat, and so there's a continuum. And if we don't get information ahead of time, and this is what getting left the boom is, having systems in place where you're gathering uh, potential behaviors or concerns involving this individual. You're, you're looking at social media for information. You're looking at what's called leakage. So you're bringing all these information in, you're connecting these dots. And if you see in the middle there, there's an information gap. And if you're not getting this information in which you can work on it and, 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 and it become actionable, 
then that then that uh, particular issue, that crisis, can continue to go upwards, and and uh, God forbid you have a catastrophic outcome. And again, you cannot assess anything or act upon it if you don't know what it is. And again, again, it takes everybody coming together, looking at things very proactive, uh, working in in unison, working together with different professions, uh, different vocations, and and with one committed goal, and that is to help the organization be healthy and help each individual to be well. Well, thank you, Bill. And uh, and I think we do have Heather on a, on a direct line. Heather, do we have you on the line? I don't know. Do you have me? Uh, yes, we have you, Heather. And, uh, you know, to build on and to wrap up, before we go to our, uh, our, our survey, uh, both John and, and you've been working closely with John and uh, Chief Adcox, address this issue of the catastrophic event and information, the information gap, and you as a champion and a winner of the Global Patient Safety Award for your constant vigilance and also taking the high road in an environment where, you know, when something bad happens, a lot of people run for the hills. And we just want to give you the opportunity to just give your message to other nurses of taking, always taking the high road no matter what happens. Sometimes HR cannot be behaving in your best interest in, in their organizations. Can you just, a general message, not one specific to your situation, but you've been a great example of constantly taking the high road. Your message to other nurses when these bad events can occur. Um, sure, well, thank you so much for having me, Chuck. Um, um, my first advice to them is if they ever face a situation where their patient is in, um, in dire need, or in my case, um, the resuscitative efforts or lack of that um, did not work for her, um, and therefore she passed away, is to lay low and stay calm. Um, I wish I had known that in the very beginning. Um, this is time and a season for everything, I think. Um, but as I think Jen said earlier, the culture um, that you're in is going to really dictate um, how you speaking to power is going to be directed um, in, in terms of um, how you're going to be treated. Um, but, and then find a support group. I, like, I, I just can't believe that um, patient advocacy group, Dan Ford especially, thank you for those hours that you sat listening to me um, cry. Um, I think it was Arlene that mentioned I've spent many a time in the bathroom crying at work. Um, and then I just I turned to that true north. Uh, whatever it is where you draw your strength from, I, I really encourage people to hone in on that and, and stay the course. Um, I think one of the big, biggest influences in my life that my father spoke about a lot was William Wilberforce. Um, I think about him and how many years he had to fight for the, um, um, the, the slave trade in England, and it, it finally passed. And I believe that all these initiatives that we're working on um, are, are going to come to fruition as long as we, um, you know, keep our focus centered. Well, thank you, and thank you for really being a great example of taking the high road. What I'm going to do right now is I'm just going to review quickly the questions on the survey. Kyle, would you bring the survey up, and then we'll go back to Dan, Arlene, and uh, Jenny. Um, uh, the first question is, I'm interested in another webinar on burnout and patient safety impact. We believe that this is a really key issue, and we'll have Dr. Swenson and other organizations who've been working on burnout to reduce the potential risk of preventable error and harm. Let us know the topics that you want to cover. The second question in the survey is, I'm interested in another webinar on protecting caregivers through HR. And this is the issue that John and Heather have addressed of when a bad event occurs or when uh, there's an environment where uh, there's not trust in the support systems of HR, what are the things we can practically do for our caregivers, for our staff uh, that could be best practices and I think Chief Adcox, we're working on some uh, codes of conduct that could have uh, a, a terrific uh, impact. And then what are the specific HR areas that you want us to address? We're definitely going to do a webinar on this. We want to hear from you on what topics you want to do. And uh, Kyle would ask me to ask you, make sure to answer all the questions before you hit submit so that you make sure that all your answers are uh, collectively together submitted. 
We want to know whether you want more on emergency medicine and patient safety. We're hearing that there's really a critical need now, and many of our leaders are really, really interested in focusing on more in the emergency medicine side, pre-hospital, through the emergency department, but also the transition in care from the emergency department back to the outpatient clinic and the handoffs, worm handoffs, and the handoffs uh, between uh, these uh, these players. Uh, very important. Uh, and the, the next question was regarding pain management of the opioids. We're going to bring Dr. Gladstone McDowell back uh, to address the five rights of pain management, and then how do we deal with reducing our risks of Pain, a pain that is refractory to meds and not overdoing pulling back on pain, but hitting the right balance of the pain medicines of the five rights of pain management and dealing with this issue of the opioid challenges uh, and drug diversion. So uh, we are going to bring back Kimberly New and Dr. Uh, Dr. McDowell on those topics. Let me just go back uh, quickly. We're over time now, a couple of minutes, and uh, give some final comments to uh, Dan Ford and then Arlene, and then we'll go to Jennifer to wrap us up. Dan, I, I shortened you up just a little bit because I knew we were running late. Were there final comments you want to make about, uh, about root cause analysis and patients and families? Heather? I've left the meeting. Dan Ford, are you on mute? I'm here, sorry. Um, the, the one comment I was about to make earlier, Chuck, and, I, and I, 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 was more, I should have been more sensitive to the time, was having the fact that inviting the patient family to participate can contribute to the healing of everybody. Dr. Swenson talked about taking care of each other. Heather just talked about crying in the bathroom. John talked about behavior and accountability. And I can't imagine a doctor, a patient, or, and or a nurse, excuse me, being involved in a preventable harm and death, uh, uh, event, death, or whatever, um, and not inviting the patient's family member to participate in that root cause analysis. I can't imagine that doctor and nurse going the rest of their life with that hurt in, the gut, in their gut because they wanted to do all of the things that you folks just talked about or alluded to or should have done. Uh, there's just so much hurt going on in addition to the hurting that the patient and the family is already doing. That's probably my, my strongest push uh, for inviting, keyword is invite, inviting the patient and family to participate. That's Great. It, Thank, Thank you, you, Dan. Great comment. Uh, Arlene. Um, I first want to thank you, Chuck, for uh, your 10 years with the webinar and 120 webinars. That's fantastic. Um, as you realize, too, we all do, we've been, um, there's been a lot of accomplishments in patient safety, and we still have a lot to do. Very complex, but I, I like to see the care of the caregiver uh, and bullying. Bullying is such an issue in all walks of life now, and I think we need to look at that when it comes to patient safety. So thank you again, Chuck. Great. Thank you, Arlene. Jenny, we're going to give you the last word. You always give us a good last word. Please finish us up today, and thank you for all of the work you and Dan and Arlene and, and Mary and all of you have done. Uh, this really, I think, one of the greatest celebration issues that we can have is the hacks and that you guys stepped up at a time when no one asked you to. Well, thank you, Dr. Denham, and, and Dan, and Arlene, and Mary, and Heather, and, and John, and, and everyone, our speakers today, those present and not. It was such a great webinar. I learned so much. And, and you know, we've gotten a great deal of accomplishments since this all began, and the medication reconciliation. You guys are my heroes. You really are. Just keep doing your great work. But I still think we we actually still got a long way to go with regard to, you know, engaging patients more and, and going way back to the very beginning, uh, listen to the patient and the family about everything and anything that they might want to share with you and um, and, and take care of each other. Um, you know, it's, it's horrible when our caregivers don't have the care that they need. And I have seen myself, nurses crying in bathrooms. And, um, you know, it doesn't take much. And I was just a visitor, and this one gal was, was in tears, and I kind of gave her a hug and thanked her for doing all she does. 
and she said I made her weak. <laughs> so these these people, that's what they need. Um, you know, frontline providers. It's it's a battle out there, and with everything that's going on with infections and and new illnesses and and all of the complexities, diseases, and the systems that we have to go through, and all of the all of the data entry. You know, it's it's just so complicated. I think if anything. We need to go back to something simple, simpler in, in medicine, and we have to rebuild relationships and, and um, between patients, families, providers, and trust, because right now there is a lot of trust issues on all sides of the spectrum. <laughs> Lastly, again, I can't ask you enough to please support those who have experienced um, negative outcomes, harm inside workers and, and patients and families. And uh, here's to another 10 years and another 100 years. As I said, we still got a long way to go, but we have done so much. And thank you all again. And I'll turn it back over to you, Dr. Denham. God bless you all. Thank you, Jenny. And uh, so uh, we look forward to seeing you all in December, and we'll be sending out invitations. And uh, God bless you all. And if the speakers could stay on for a minute so we could see how we can get do better each time. So many thanks, and have a great month.